today we're going to finish our series uh, that we've been in for the last uh, several months called Doctrine and Difficult Questions, and I'm sure you're all glad to bring this to an end, uh, as am I. <laughs> and next week we're going to start a new uh, brief series before I leave for the uh, fall, and we're going to look at uh, the book of First Samuel in the Old Testament. We'll just take the first few chapters of uh, 1 Samuel and uh, go through that Old Testament book, and I'm really excited about that. So that's where we'll be beginning next week. But today I want to talk about the idea of uh, sanctification. This is a more of a doctrinal sermon, not a difficult question. Uh, but I want to talk about the idea of sanctification. And so you've probably heard the terms justification and sanctification. And so what is the difference? Okay, justification is the act by which God pronounces you righteous because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, it's a, it's a one-time judicial act that God pronounces you righteous because of your faith in Jesus Christ. All right, that we all need that. If you have not, if that has not happened to you, then you're not a Christian. That's the that's what makes a person a Christian at the start is the act of justification, which God alone can do. But after you're justified, God doesn't just leave us as we are. God works to bring us into conformity with his will in conformity with his son. And that process is called sanctification. That's the process of sanctification. It's the process by which God makes us holy, okay? He's, he sanctifies us. He sets us apart. He cuts us out, okay? Sin's power in our lives is weakened, okay? And we all need that, okay? This is the beautiful thing about the Christian faith. God doesn't clean you up first and then save you, God saves you and then begins to perfect you, okay? That's the process. Sin's power is weakened and destroyed over time, and the Holy Spirit is given more and more rule in our lives, in every area of our life. It usually doesn't happen all at once, okay? Uh, you might be thinking, gosh, I'd really wish God would just get control of me, okay? And it, it doesn't really work like that. He, he generally kind of works in pieces and parts, and uh, little things here and there, and slowly he has a, a master plan that he's weaving in your life to bring you all into the conformity of Christ. All right, the, the process of sanctification is actually not focused on rescuing us from external evil, it's actually rescuing us from us, all right? Do you ever feel like you need that? You need help getting away from yourself? Well, good news, if you're a Christian, that's what God's doing. He's saving you from yourself. He's rescuing you from yourself. No matter how long you have been a Christian, you are in the process of sanctification. The process of sanctification is ongoing from the moment of justification until you are glorified on the day you either die or the day that Jesus returns, Lord willing, soon, okay? Then you will be glorified. God's word is a powerful tool in that process, okay? We need God's word to help us, but it's not, sanctification is not just the process of acquiring information, okay? It's not just about how biblically smart you are, because some of you are actually incredibly biblically smart, probably much smarter than I am. I can verify that. But you can be theologically astute and biblically literate and remain quite unsanctified. Okay? The level of sanctification does not necessarily equate to your level of biblical knowledge. That's dangerous for Christians because sometimes we think because we know things, then that makes us holy. That's not the same thing. Knowing things about God does not equate to personal holiness. All right? Sanctification is about heart and life transformation. It's about character reformation. 
It's about being molded by the power of God's hand into the likeness of Jesus Christ. You will look the same. Okay, I wish God would do some molding on the outside. That's kind of what I was hoping for, but apparently that's not part of the process, at least not this side of glory. I'm hoping in glory there will be some work done on the outside, okay? Thank you, Avery, for laughing at that particular little joke. All right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have a feeling we're all going to look pretty much the same. Uh, you're going to look the same. You're, actually, your natural gifts are going to probably remain the same. Your personality is going to remain intact, but you will not be the same. After years of God's sanctifying grace in your life, you will be more and more like Jesus. Okay, and I'll say more about that at the end. I'm going to ask you some diagnostic questions. The reading of God's word, prayer, the preaching and teaching of scripture, the ordinances, public worship, the ministry of the body of Christ, all of us together, uh, all of these are tools that God uses to sanctify us. But they actually are incomplete without the work of the Holy Spirit. We need the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, he says this, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. All right, do you see there's two parts to the process going on? You're working and God is working. Sanctification is a call to obedience. It's a call to submit every aspect of our person and every part of our lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't rest on our obedience. It rests on the powerful, present, and active saving grace of the Lord. As we're working, God is overseeing that work and overruling that work to bring our lives into conformity with Christ. In Philippians 1, verse 6, Paul says this, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Notice what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say this, I am confident that you will get your act together, take your salvation seriously, and obey as you've been commanded. It's not about you. It's about what God is doing. It's about God who started the good work. It's about God who will carry it on to completion. That's where our confidence is that God is doing something in our life. So maybe you feel like right now, maybe nothing's going on. Maybe you feel like there's an area that is remaining unaddressed in your life or that you're having a particular struggle with. Listen, it's God's work, and he is working, and he will continue to work as you submit more and more of your life to him. He will work out the process of bringing you into conformity with his will. The problem is that sin still remains, okay? That's the problem. Sin still remains. We have wandering, unfaithful hearts because sin still lives in us. There are times when the world looks more attractive to us than it should, because sin still lives inside of us, we get lazy and impatient, abandoning the commitments we've made. Because sin still lives inside of us, there's a war in our hearts pulling us back and forth between God and created things. Because sin still lives inside of us, there are moments when we allow ourselves to question God's goodness, faithfulness, and love. That's why it was not enough for God to just forgive us and adopt us, just to justify us. He's chosen to live in us by the Holy Spirit. He sent the Comforter to be present with us, to be in the work of rescuing us, restoring us, empowering our conversion and our final transition. We all need the essential help of God's saving grace because sin is malevolent. It's deceitful. It will, it will trip you up. It is always lurking in the corners of your heart. It's harmful, destructive. It's never good. Sin is something you should never find a place, 
a way to live with. We have in our house right now a gecko. Do any of you have geckos in your house? Yeah. Have you ever tried to catch a gecko? Yeah, you can't. You can hit it off the wall? Well, I haven't even tried. I, I, would, I would hurt myself in the process. Yeah. But my wife, I'm sorry, honey, I have to throw you. I'm not going to throw you under the bus, but I'll just tell the truth about you. My wife would prefer that we move to a new apartment. <laughs> like when, when little animals and bugs show up in our house, I'll never forget the first time. She thought because we lived on the 13th floor, we were immune to bugs. Like we, we had a newer building, and so all the bugs were downstairs, and they weren't coming upstairs. Well, they finally came upstairs. And the first time a cockroach showed up in the middle of the night when she got up to go to the bathroom, that scream was blood curdling. <laughs> and she wanted to burn the building to the ground. And I told her that was not acceptable. We weren't allowed to do that. And we, we also couldn't afford to move at the time, so we were going to have to figure out uh, you know, how to live with these things. But for her, it's a war, which is good. That's a, that's a picture of the war we need to have with sin. We shouldn't tolerate it. Okay? My wife does not tolerate bugs. Do you tolerate sin in your life? There's no acceptable toleration of sin for the Christian. The goal of God's sanctifying grace in our lives is the ultimate and final death of sin that remains in us. Let's listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 7. He says, The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. Just think about that for a second. Your old nature, its mindset is in opposition to God. There, there is no situation in which your old sinful nature is thinking, I want to serve God. It doesn't. It's against God. Because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, Paul says, it is unable to do so. It's broken because of the fall. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however... That's it's talking to you, Christians. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So Paul's drawing a clear line. Listen, there is no middle ground of kind of Christian. You either are or you are not. Okay? So then, brothers and sisters... Verse 12, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You will live. So it's not a spiritually rational option to be passive when it comes to the presence and destructive power of sin in our lives. The only option is to participate with the Spirit's work in our lives to put sin to death. How do we do this? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes this. He says, Since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So here's one way. There are many ways in the scriptures that we're commanded to fight the, fight the flesh. But here's one way. Anything, thought, desire, motivation, purpose, plan, attitude, or action that opposes the knowledge of God must be destroyed. We take it captive and we destroy it. How? By the truth of God and his word. 
We use the power of God's word. That's why we constantly encourage you from this pulpit to read God's word daily so that his word saturates your mind, so that you know it, so that it flows out of you, so the Holy Spirit has tools to use in helping you fight this battle. But sanctification is not only about the death of sin, it's also about our new life in Christ. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says this, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him. In Christ, we have been raised to newness of life. And Paul says, because of that, we should seek the things that are above. What does he mean? Paul is calling for us to live in active pursuit of the blessings that we have in Christ, the blessings that flow down to us from Jesus to us here on earth. Instead of pursuing empty and temporary treasures and pleasures of this created world, Paul encourages us to pursue this life of transformation. Sanctification really is a lifelong process, okay? So don't get hung up in the momentary struggles. It's a marathon, not a sprint. A hammer in a carpenter's hand has no power by itself. It needs the carpenter to wield it, to use it, to drive the nail into a piece of word, wood. So it is with the tools of God, his word, the church, all these different graces I've mentioned. They have no power on their own apart from the work of the Holy Spirit who uses them to continue his work in our hearts and lives. So in conclusion, I, I want to give you five or six ways that the Holy Spirit actually works in our lives, okay? Here are some of the ways that the Holy Spirit works. Number one, the Holy Spirit continues the life-renewing work in our hearts, okay? The Holy Spirit continues the life-renewing work in our hearts, continually renews our, the work in our hearts. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, Paul encourages with the, us with this fact. He says, although our physical bodies are in the process of decay, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Okay? All of you who are in your 40s and 50s understand this verse better than almost anybody else in here. Our bodies are in a process of decay. Okay? But if you're a Christian... The inner self is being renewed, okay? No matter what the outward state is like for the Christian, the inner self ought to be growing more and more vibrant as you grow in years. No matter how frail the outward body becomes, the inward life ought to become more and more rich and full. This ought to be true for all Christians. All right, number two, the Spirit blesses us with his ministry of the conviction of sin. Conviction of sin, by the way, is not judgment, but rather our loving Heavenly Father through the eye-opening and heart-softening work of the Spirit drawing us near so we walk closer and closer to him. All right, when you feel conviction of sin, that's God pricking your heart and trying to wake you up. He's working with you in the process of sanctification to say, don't do this. Step away. Run away. Fight sin with me. I'm with you. I'm working with you in this process. Okay? So receive that. Don't cower in shame. Don't run away from God at that point. Don't go deeper into sin, but work with God to allow his Holy Spirit to transform you. The Bible says our hearts are prone to wander, and that is true. But conviction of sin is actually meant to draw us back closer to God. Number three, the Spirit illuminates God's word for us. Jesus said this in John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For every Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, in your life, ready to help you, help illuminate God's word for you when you read it. 
all right? So if you read the scriptures, listen, here's a, here's a real simple test if you're a Christian or not. If you open your Bible and you read it and you go, I have no idea what this is saying, you're probably not a Christian. Okay? Because the Holy Spirit actually illuminates God's word for us. If you have the Holy Spirit, he will help you understand. The Holy Spirit continues to work so that we'll have deeper and deeper levels of understanding of the truth of God's word. And some of you might be younger Christians and you might be saying, yeah, well, can I just read it once and be done with it? No, you can't. <laughs> The, the, the Bible is like a, uh, oh, it's like a swimming pool. You start out in the shallow end, and it's fun for a little while, but once you learn how to swim, then you go on to the deeper end, and you find that there's treasures. Okay, that illustration didn't work out so well. <laughs> anyway, anyway, just, you know, work with me a little bit. All right, so anyway, you go on to the deeper end, and it's more and more fun, and then you try the diving board, and... All right, anyway, so anyway, my point is it's, it's definitely worth it to keep reading the scriptures over and over again. All right, number four, am I on number four? The Spirit empowers us to obey. Listen, sin is working to cripple you and weaken you at all times. Sin is not passive, by the way. Sin is not passive. It's not just sitting around going, well, I hope you mess up. Sin is out to get you. Sin is out to trip you up. The devil, the world, and the flesh are all out to attack you and mess you up spiritually. So you have to be on your guard, and that's why the Spirit, we need the Spirit to help us obey what God has commanded us to do because, the sin, because sin will leave us unable to obey God. The grace of the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and empowers us to take new steps of faith and obedience and gain new ground in our growth of grace. All right, number five, I think. The Spirit carries our cries to the Father. All right, how many of you feel like your prayer life is just on fire, like you have the most amazing prayer life in the world? All right, I'm not going to ask you to lift your hands, but I already know the answer. Probably maybe one or two of you do. I would imagine most of you are like me probably and you feel like my prayer life can use some work. All right, that's probably what most of us need. Because we don't always understand what God is doing. We're confused as to what we're supposed to be doing. We're confused as to what we're supposed to be praying all the time. Um, we don't know what we should pray for. But Paul says this in Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. Isn't that great news? Isn't that really good news? Yeah, some of you have, uh, well, many of you have had little children. And as your child is learning to talk, right, there's this, there's this little window of time where they have like their own language and nobody can understand it except you, the parent, you know, and they babble. And so you're the interpreter for everybody else. Oh, this is what they're saying. They want that. Oh, this is what they're saying. They, would, they want you to do this. You're the interpreter. Listen, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. You're like a little babbling child trying to express in the best words that you can what you want God to hear. And the Holy Spirit says, I'll interpret for you. I'll take your words and I will speak to the Father on your behalf. Isn't that, doesn't that just like comfort your heart? That is such good news. All right, number whatever. The Spirit reminds us that we are God's adopted children. You have been adopted into the family of God. You've been brought in. You've been sealed with his name. You're no longer an outsider. You're an insider. You've been given a seat at the table. You're one of God's precious children. Finally, the Spirit keeps us. 
all the ministries of the Holy Spirit that we've been considering are God's means of protecting us, guarding us, growing our hearts as we walk the road toward the likeness of Jesus Christ. We're not just convicted, enabled, and comforted, but because we are, we are kept by the Holy Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit keeps us from the day of our salvation until the day of our translation. Our faith, listen, your faith and your obedience are not what keeps you. It's the Holy Spirit who has the keeping power. What's God's ultimate goal in sanctification? Be holy as I am holy. We have a long way to go, don't we? I do. I don't like to wait. I, I, I think most of us don't like to wait at all. If, you're, if, if I've driven around you in Taiwan, or if you've driven in Taiwan, you don't like to wait, right? Nobody likes to wait. We don't like lines. We don't like to be told that dinner isn't ready yet. We don't like traffic. We get impatient when our computer fails to load slowly. Listen, those of us who grew up in 1980s, we know what it's like to have a slow computer, okay? <laughs> you people today, you got it easy. But sanctification, God actually invites you to wait. Your conformity to the likeness of Jesus Christ is a process, not an event. Some, in, in God's wisdom, he knew that this was the very best way to achieve his goals. To make sanctification a process by which you are conformed to the image of Christ rather than him snapping his fingers and translating you into some super creature. Waiting for the believer never indicates God's absence, his passivity, or a lack of care, or his unfaithfulness. Waiting is a sign that you are under the control of his grace. Because if you had control, you wouldn't wait. Isaiah 40, 31 says this. Hear it, hear it with this in mind about the waiting. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Did you catch that? Different translations say it different ways, so it's not exactly the same as up on the board. It's my, what I'm using here. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So, some final diagnostic questions. Okay, let's just, let's all do a little self-examination here. How is your sanctification coming along? How are you doing? Are you being changed? At times, there might be some big, earth-shattering changes that happen in your life. Maybe you go to a conference, maybe there's a sermon that particularly affects you, maybe you have a Bible study that really deeply changes you, that, that's, that's great and incredible. But more than likely, most often, there's going to be slow, gradual changes over time that will slowly reveal the work of Christ in your heart. What hopefully you're going to be discovering as a Christian is, is this, it's really simple, that the fruit of the Spirit becomes more and more prevalent in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So maybe when you get home tonight, before you go to bed, you just want to pull those verses back out. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And just think about, okay, compared to last year, am I more loving this year than I was last year? Am I more joyful this year than I was last year? Love, joy, peace. Am I more peaceful this year than I was last year? Okay, I wouldn't compare it day by day. Okay, I wouldn't say am I more patient today than I was yesterday. But over some period of time, there should be a change in your life. 
Here's what a Christian should never say, and I've said this to you before. A Christian should never say, well, I'm just an angry person. That's just who I am. No Christian can ever say that. Not in good conscience, my friends. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is to transform you from what you were into what God wants you to be. So maybe you were an angry person, but you ought to be less angry today than you were before. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. You ought to have more and more wisdom in your life. Okay, not just knowledge. You ought to have wisdom for how to handle the situations that are, arise in your life. All right? And you'll find your life more and more in tune with Jesus. Your love for him will grow more deeply. Worship will become more and more meaningful over time. If none of these things are true for you, then you really have to ask yourself, am I really a Christian? The good news is, if you're not, you can become one. The door to the kingdom of God is wide open, and you can step through it tonight by repenting of your sin and putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You can be a Christian tonight. Jesus tells a parable and he talks about seed that is sown. He says a, a farmer went out to sow the seed and the seed is the, is the gospel. It's the good news of the kingdom. And the farmer sows the seed and some seed falls on rocky soil, some seed falls on uh, weedy soil, uh, some seed falls on the path, but some seed falls on good soil, and the good soil represents the human heart. Actually, all those different er things represent different kinds of human hearts, okay? So, again, the, the illustration is try trying to point out that when the seed falls on good soil, fruit is produced. And Jesus says when it falls on that good soil, the crop comes out 30, 60, and 100 fold. But when it fell on the other kinds of soil, it died or it was stolen away. What kind of soil are you tonight? You good soil? What kind of fruit is being produced in your life? sanctification we're all in it so let's encourage each other in the process let's pray heavenly father thank you so much for your scriptures your words of encouragement to us tonight and i thank you that you don't just leave us where we are that you have by your great wisdom and design uh, put us into the process of becoming more christ-like as we uh, come to you in faith and then you take us and begin this transformative process of changing our hearts changing our minds changing our wills and removing sin's power releasing us from sin's power breaking sin's power in our life so we don't have to stay who we are God I pray that for every person here tonight that you would help them to grow in sanctification. Help us to examine ourselves carefully tonight that we would once again yield ourselves to your spirit, that we would pray and ask the spirit to work mightily in our lives, that we could become more Christ-like day by day, week by week, month by month, and year by year to give you glory, honor, and praise and for our good. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.